Okay, let's get started again. Now that we have some caffeine and some sugar. Um, so our next speaker is actually a keynote speaker for advocacy. Uh, Ian Cause is, from, is the director of advocacy and campaign of the Donkey Sanctuary. And he's gonna talk about donkeys and the UN, the United Nations. Thank you. It's your yours, Ian. Well, thank you very much uh, for that uh, kind introduction, and uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, address you all today. Um, uh, I hope you can see my slide uh, on your screen at the moment. It's the two uh, sentences we said most in the last two years. Can you see that? So the other one is you're on mute. So I'll try and avoid both of those things today um, if I can. So. Uh, as I just said, I am the uh, Director of Advocacy and Campaigns at uh, the Donkey Sanctuary. And I want to talk to you a little bit today about the importance of getting work in equity and more generally animals onto the agenda of the United Nations. And for that matter, other intergovernmental organisations as well. Uh, and, and, and a little bit about uh, how work in equity, our work on that is progressing at the moment. Especially at this time, uh, the, uh, the 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 seventh session of the uh, General Assembly of the United Nations is currently ongoing, and of course, you've probably seen in the news as well that COP twenty seven is ongoing, uh, and these are big forum making big decisions about the future of the planet and how we, uh, as people who are interested in donkeys and in animal welfare and did work in the animal welfare field. Uh, it's important that we find ways to engage with these processes. We find ways of describing why animals are important and, and we start to move the world to a future where that uh, interaction between human, humans and animals is recognised. And uh, I should also say how impressed I am that there's an audience who have given up their Sunday to hear about how the United Nations works. I think that's an incredible uh, devoted devotion to your to to your, to your duty. Um, when I, so when I first came to uh, the Donkey Sanctuary a few years ago now, uh, I'm not sure that my slides are moving on. Has my first slide moved? Hello. Hold on one sec. At the moment, I can only see my initial opening slide. It was working when we tested it. Yeah, I, uh, sorry, I don't know what happened. Don't... Ah, there we go. Oh, there you go. It's just a delay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, a, it was a very long delay. It's not going to be that long all the time. <laughs> anyway, this uh, this capture sort of quite neatly sums up what I was asked to do when I first came to the Donkey Sanctuary, which was basically to take that enormous thing of the United Nations and say, is there any way of actually getting the the, the plight of donkeys and mules in into their work? Uh, and this was something I had some experience of because in my previous role, I'd been director of policy. Uh, and external affairs at World Animal Protection, um, where, of course, that organisation deals with a much larger range of animals. Uh, but we've done a lot of work uh, as the uh, sustainable development goals were being developed, trying to work out where the opportunities were for animals. So there was always the opportunity, I think, of doing something with donkeys and mules in, in, in this. And I should also say that the Donkey Sanctuary, before me, was already involved in intergovernmental advocacy with organisations such as the UN Food and Agriculture Organisation, uh, the FAO, as it's probably better known to many of you, uh, and the OIE, the World Organisation for Animal Health, which we're now encouraged to call WOE, if you, if you didn't know that. So the challenge was, how do we get governments to acknowledge the role work and efforts play in society? where that's applicable, it's obviously different in different parts of the world, and to get that to include them in their planning by 
understanding that the health and welfare of their working animals is key in developing a sustainable future for their communities. So that all sounds very sensible, but on day one, where do you begin? Well, you've probably all seen this uh, logo before, but or, or if you haven't seen this specific one, you will certainly have seen a version of it. So these are the 17 sustainable development goals that the uh, UN has decided, and through that all the governments of the world have decided, to try and work towards. Um, the history of this, for those that don't know, and apologies for those who I'm uh, just repeating what you, you well know, is that there was a set of goals called the Millennium Development Goals, uh, and they ran from the year 2000, obviously, up to the year 2015. But they only applied to the developing world, uh, and they were really very much aimed uh, at a very fixed part of the world and to the poverty and hunger in the UK. It was Make Poverty History was a, it was way it was snappily uh, entitled, and there were other versions of that across the world. Uh, and, and when they started to decide what should come after that, um, there was a view that actually there was no point in having goals just for the developing world the issues facing the planet and facing humankind are for all governments and for all people and for all things that inhabit the planet and so therefore this much wider set of goals were designed to try and find ways that governments can work together and take action in their own societies to try and make the planet a more sustainable uh have a, have a more sustainable future now, what you can see here is a, a set of images of donkeys in various settings around the world. And you can see that, uh, it, that, that they're an integral part of communities. And any planning for a sustainable future has to take into account their needs, their health and their welfare. But if that's obvious to us, the inevitable drive to see this work as being about humankind means there is work to do to make people see the bigger picture. I should say, when the United Nations was formed, I mean, it started right at the very start of the Constitution. It's of the people, for the people. Uh, and it's taken a long time, and there's still work to be done to get the United Nations to see that actually, if we're going to have better lives and a better planet for, for humans, then the considerations and the actions that will achieve that will have to include animals as well. It's not a competition. So how does the UN work? Well, this is key, I think, to understanding how you may be able to drive change through this forum. And the two things to understand straight away is that the United Nations works by consensus. So that is important because whatever it is that you're going to try to achieve, you basically have to get it to a position where pretty much everybody supports it, or at least is willing to tolerate it. And so that's why negotiations and things take a while and the hard work. It's simply because it has to get to a, a stage, a position where everybody's happy to get behind it uh, and to support it. And the other thing is that it works by partnerships. And so for us in the NGO world as charities, we have to understand that it's extremely unlikely that you will make progress unilaterally. And even if we work together as animal welfare groups, which is increasingly the case, that is a step forward, but it's still not enough. What we need to find are the partners who are doing other work at the United Nations, but we have some sort of synergy, some sort of interest that we can join together because it's these partnerships that form the voices that can bring in the governments, bring in the UN departments, and, effect, and eventually we get the consensus that can lead to change. And the other important thing to bear in mind is the importance of language. The UN works by approved language. There are many languages in the world and words mean slightly different things in different parts of the world. So they have a process for approving language. So this is very important uh, and it's a bit technical, but nevertheless is a key thing in trying to affect change. So if you want to change something for your cause, 
you need to think very hard about the language that, that can be used to do that. It will have to go through a UN process to approve it. Um, and so really, when trying to affect change at the United Nations, you either need to get a lot of supporters across a lot of fields to agree with the language that you want to insert into their work, or you have to look through all of the language that has already been approved and then see if you can make that work for the things that you're starting to, you're, you're trying to achieve. So understanding that the donkey sanctuary was very unlikely to achieve very much by itself and also understanding there was not very much language, I wouldn't say there was none, but not very much language that we could refer to, back to, we decided to uh, dip our toes into the uh, waters of the United Nations uh, to see to see how warm those waters were. And I should say, we always knew that both the donkey sanctuary and the cause of working equids and donkeys, horses, mules, were at square one of the board and a lot of issues, a lot of organisations and a lot of partnerships were very much further uh, ahead in the field than we were. So my description of where we began uh, was almost, I, I use like a Formula One racing uh, analogy. I don't particularly know why, because I don't particularly like Formula One racing, but it seemed to suit quite well where we were. What you get in Formula One is you get cars going down a grid, and at the front of the grid, you've got the ones that everybody's interested in and, and all the press are talking about and all the people in the industry are talking about, and you get increasingly further back down the grid uh, as it's uh, as as they are newer or perhaps not as efficient or have still got a lot of work to do. We were definitely not in that situation. I suppose if if um, if if we were in Formula One, I'd like the Donkey Sanctuary to look a bit like this, you know. So there's the uh, Red Bull Formula One car, which is currently the world leader, and I'd like us and uh, those that we work with and the cause for donkeys and mules to be up at the front of the grid, so everybody's interested in chatting about it. But in reality, I live in the real world, and I know that we started a bit more like this. Um, what we, 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 there was two of us in the Donkey Sanctuary, and we had a UN consultant, uh, uh, but we set off in good cheer uh, with a determination to try to uh, to try to change the world for donkeys and mules. And we started with a very simple message, because where do you begin? Uh, and our earliest message was simply to take some of the sustainable development goals which had now been approved and they're going to run until the end of 2030, so they're going to be around for quite a long time. Now, I was aware because of my work at World Animal Protection that to a certain extent we'd missed the boat. The uh, sustainable development goals were negotiated sort of through 2012, 13, 14, up to 15 when they began. Um, and there was nobody arguing for working animals at that time. And, uh, and therefore, they were crafted and created without that input. Um, the opportunity, because the, the sustainable development goals are not going to change. There, there will be a success, and we don't know what that will be yet. But post-2030, something else will come along. But there is a mid-term review for the SDGs, uh, and that's coming up next year. And that gives as an opportunity to start to talk to governments, particularly those with large numbers of working equids, to talk about the things they can do to, um, to, to, to recognise them in their planning to achieve the sustainable development goals. So our early messaging was literally this simple. We pulled out, and it's not even, I mean, that's not uh, an exhaustive list, we pulled out a number of the SDGs that actually the successful achievement in many countries would be dependent on what happens to the working animals that are, are linked to their achievements. And we simply have very simple graphics like this. And we spent a lot of time talking to people. And, uh, and our very first partner was World Horse Welfare, which, of course, is an organisation that I'm sure is many and will be known to many of you. Um, and our earliest, our earliest engagements were simply about talking about donkeys and mules for us, horses for world horse welfare, and starting the conversation and trying to find who were the shakers and movers and who were the allies who were likely, likely to at least start conversations about where working equids 
um, could fit into this process and how we could ensure that they live better lives uh, as a result. But we moved on uh, and we then moved to build our partnerships. We then brought in our friends at Brook and our friends at Sparner. We already work together uh, in a coalition called the International Coalition for Work in Equids, or ICWI is the uh, snappy acronym is. Uh, and clearly, there was a lot of a, a lot of sense in us coming together to work on something that is as global as the sustainable future of the planet. And this photograph uh, was actually taken at the United Nations at the high level political forum on the SDGs uh, back in the summer of 2019. Uh, when I say high level political forum, by the way, that's another uh, United Nations thing. Um, everything's high I've, I've never i've never ever known them describe anything as a low level political forum but they like their words and that's the way they choose to describe it uh and and actually that photograph was taken um in the plaza which is opposite the main entrance to the united nations and we had a whole day there where we spoke about donkeys horses and mules uh, and we set up a whole series of stands a whole series of exhibitions we even had uh, a virtual reality set of goggles that people could, uh, in a very, very live way, look to see how these uh, donkeys especially are used in the brick kiln industry. Uh, and it was a really successful day. We were able to uh, speak to lots of UN delegates, occasional ambassadors, people from the various UN departments, uh, the occasional member of public who was a bit bemused by what was going on, uh, and even the New York Police Department, who came to check that our uh, accreditations and passes were in order. Uh, and when they found out they were, they took a toy donkey to keep in the uh, station in their precinct. So I hope that's still, I hope that's still there now. But slowly we were starting to just build an awareness in people at the United Nations that you know working equids are real things and. They are sentient beings and they deserve to have a better life than they do now. But perhaps most importantly, that the things that they want to do at the United Nations will not happen easily in many parts of the world if they don't include work in equids uh, in their thinking and all of the things that they want to achieve. So we wrote this report. It's a very brief report. It was used more as a as, as, as a, a, a lobbying thing, uh, and it's called Ach Achieving Agenda 2030. Agenda 2030 is basically the SDGs. So you know, the agenda is how do we get there, and then what do we do beyond that? Um, at the top of that slide, you should be able to see the website link to the ICWI website, and you can download this report if you want to have a look at it. And um, I did catch. Uh, some of the questions from the previous session and I heard uh, a few questions around you know what do we know in terms of how can we where's the value where's the data on how important work and equities are to their communities uh, I mean I'd be the first to say I wish there was a larger database I wish there was more research in it it's coming there's more of it going on at the donkey sanctuary we've got programs where we're trying to show uh, uh in a way that is very well evidence based that uh, the care and uh, the care of work in equids is linked to the outputs that the United Nations want. But in this report, there are quite a lot of examples. And so if people are interested in the things we can show about how um, looking after work in equids has a benefit to the people who are relying on them, there's quite a lot in this report, which uh, you, I, I'd encourage you to look at uh, and, and see what you think. So since then, we've been trying to build the partnerships that will affect change. And as I said before, those partnerships can't just be within the uh, animal welfare world. We have to try and find the people uh, who would have a shared interest and would be able to work with us. Um, at the United Nations, they like the, the word cluster. Uh, and so we've joined a few clusters. Uh, some of them are very obvious. We're in the animal issues thematic cluster. So that is a group of mainly animal welfare organizations looking to see what are the joint things we can do together 
at the United Nations. We're also in the food and agriculture cluster as well, which of course is much wider, but also that's the sort of area where we can start to engage other partners who are maybe not coming from an animal welfare background, but may have a shared interest in terms of the things that we can achieve. And we've gone through the processes, and these are quite long and exhausting at time uh, processes to get various accreditations at the United Nations. So we are now an accredited uh, United Nations NGO. We're also um, accredited with the uh, UNEP, which is the UN's environmental program. Uh, we're also accredited with the UNFCCC, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it's the Framework Convention on Climate Change. And most recently, we've just uh, gained um, accreditation after a long two-year process with ECOSOC, which is the UN's Economic and Social uh, Council. And this is particularly well important for us. I mean, if we were going to do, if, if we could have chosen the chronology of that, we would have probably would have gone for this one first, but the process is very much longer. But this is the part of the UN that deals with sustainable living and deals with the SDGs. And this is the part of the UN that we are most interested in, in terms of affecting change. So it, all of those things are starting to build an awareness and a knowledge uh, that the donkey sanctuary is, is not just a few sanctuaries in the United Kingdom and various parts of Europe, but actually is working internationally to help support working donkeys and working mules across the world, wherever they are. And we're looking for partnerships with governments to help them achieve that. Uh, and it's been a very successful time in terms of being able to understand that brand. And also, as I said before, bringing in our partners to help that. But it's still very animal welfare based. So our next step on from where we are now has been to create uh, a working animal alliance. Uh, so this, as you can see, there was established by ourselves and World Horse Welfare, uh, though we are hopeful that Brooke and Sparna are going to become key members of it as well. It's worth just bearing in mind, by the way, that you can see that, you know, I started this presentation talking about very much about what we're going to do about working equids. And by now we're talking about working animals. And, you know, that is, again, developing your argument in the light of discussions with people and where it's going to go. So I'd just say two things. First of all, it's surprising how little known the term equids is anyway. Uh, and it's it's never very helpful There's somebody who is an advocate and is used to talking to people and trying to persuade them to do other things. Um, if your main name requires you to explain it every time you say it to someone, then that by itself isn't great. But actually, it's, it, it, it's more than that. It's about broadening it. You know, working animals means that other people can easily join in with us. And we've all got a vested interest in trying to work, help working animals. So for us, the move away from describing ourselves as working equids to working animals was in part to make it simpler to understand for everybody, but it was also part of allowing other people to come into the discussions and the debates. And in the Working Animal Alliance, so this is not another lobby group. This is um, a platform where everybody who's got an interest in working animals and expertise and knowledge, some data or whatever it is to share with us can easily and comfortably be part of that. So this is way more than just animal welfare groups. And we're looking to build this into an alliance that becomes firmly established part of UN processes, particularly ECOSOG. Uh, and that we then that people will come to the alliance to share their information and to, and together we can craft solutions that we can put to the United Nations to seek their approval on and and I'll come in a second to ex to describe what some of those things have been but again I think the website title is on this slide so please uh, have a look at that and 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 also if the work and animal alliance is of interest to you there's a part of the part of the screen where you can send your details in and uh, we'll make sure that you're part of our future debates and our future events. So you might ask, so that, so there's a lot of work. I hope you can see that in the last few years, there's a lot of work there to almost just position us, just to get us into the rooms, get us up the grid, if we go back to the Formula One 
um, analogy, um, but but all the time taking sensible decisions that that, that position the donkey sanctuary and our allies in a good place where we are seen as credible, where we're seen as informed, we are seen as having a solutions focused. Um, uh, approach to this work and that we are a good partner that will help and support those who are willing to be part of the work to improve the welfare of working equids. And it's not just about uh, the sustainable development goals, although that is important. Um, so a lot of this work is to be in position to be able to do something next year when when the SDGs are, are renewed, but also there's another midterm review next year, uh, and this is the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, which is almost a presentation in its own right. Well, and I, I will mention it in, in, in a minute or so, but, but, but there are opportunities for us there as well, because of course we know the key role in disasters that working animals can, can, can play. And this year, we've been part of a, a, a group of 10 animal welfare organizations who have come together to try and craft a resolution for the United Nations Environmental Assembly, which met earlier this year. Uh, and the point there, we were trying to get the United Nations to pass a resolution that finally accepted that animal welfare, the environment, a sustainable development are not three separate things they are inextricably linked and the solutions to them have to be done in a joined up way if we're going to get the result that i think absolutely everybody wants to get to now i don't know how many of you uh, good people here today are members of animal welfare organizations or have worked for animal welfare organizations all i can say is that getting 10 of them to agree <laughs> is a major achievement uh, but uh, that did happen and we were able to put that resolution to the uh, to, to the UN this year and I'm pleased to say that uh, they accepted that this is this is the UNEP's own uh, own design here and it, it talks about all of those linkages um, and you can see that the, at the bottom, this is a COVID thing. It is in part as a response to the pandemic that they are talking about what are these linkages. And so what we've managed to do is get them to agree to do, to do a report. So this report will look at the linkages, as I said, between animal welfare, between environment and sustainable development. But what's important is the way this report will be crafted it's all the people that are talking about these things all the time anyway, but except they'll all be talking together. So the it will be crafted, of course, by the UNEP. It's their piece of work. It went through their assembly. They're the lead organisation. But the report will also be authored by the World Health Organisation. It'll also be authored by the FAO. It'll also be ordered, authored by people from One Health, One Welfare. Uh, and what we the great hope for this is for the first time we will get a UN document that actually looks at all of these things together and tries to craft solutions that can work for everybody rather than people just working within their own areas. And obviously we're hopeful that uh, that will be the case. The plan is that this report will go to the next environmental assembly, which is in 2024, which I suppose when we're in November 2022 seems like it's a long way away. But actually, uh, we all know that in reality, that's not the case. This is actually something that is very pressing and we need to make progress on. Sorry, I just need to go back on there. So. Ideally, everybody want the. I'm going to come to these mules in a second, but ideally, everybody would be doing this thing because they believe in the cause of animals and the cause of animal welfare. And I think I heard a question in the, the previous session that was kind of alluded to this. Of course, it'd be good if people did it because it's the right thing to do, but in reality, they don't. So what we have to do in our work is find ways of showing why 
there are things that should be done for animals because they will help humans as well. But when I went to World Animal Protection, this is one of the things that I started to um, promote through the organisation. It, it wasn't that I wanted us to lose our animal welfare focus at all, quite the reverse. It was that I wanted us to do more for animals. I didn't want us to win theoretical arguments or to have campaigns that lots of people signed up to. Nothing wrong with that, of course. Um, but the point is, at the end of the day, to what effect? It has to make a difference. And so basically, if you want somebody to do something that you want, usually, not always, but usually there has to be something in it for them as well. And a lot of our United Nation work it, it is pitched at that level, really. It's kind of how can we get people to do things that they probably otherwise wouldn't do for animals? And the answer is because there's something in it for them. You know, I, I can well remember talking to World Animal Protection staff when we first talked about this, and there was a, well, you can imagine if you've worked for an animal welfare organisation, there, there was a bit of a reaction to it and sort of claims that, you know, we were trying to turn into a human development charity and, you know, we were very clearly an animal charity. We weren't, we definitely were not trying to turn into a human uh, a humanitarian charity at all. Uh, it's just that we could see that the best gains and the best changes would come if we could persuade people that there was a wider interest than just the animals, even though they, of course, were the most important thing to me and to us, sorry, should I say. And and, and this image here is, is an example of that. So so these are mules and they're taking firefighting equipment into an area where it's needed, but on a terrain where it'd be very difficult to get mechanised um, equipment into. Uh, and in so many parts of the world, I mean, you can have the best emergency relief vehicles in the world, but if your route to them is this, then you're going to struggle. Uh, and so we've started to talk to governments in the, uh, for the disaster risk reduction uh, review next year. But what they can do to start to acknowledge that actually what, what they need to do is they need to do more to acknowledge that at times of disaster and in times of relief, it's working animals that uh, are often at the, at the key to that. And it's not just in the it's not just working animals, and it's not just the developing world. I like to show this one because it's a great photograph of the human animal bond. And I also use it because this alludes to a story that I like to remind people about because it shows that this is this relationship is better, but still has a way to go. And it's everywhere in the world. Um, including the first world. So in America, uh, some people in this room remember uh, the great floods of New Orleans a few years ago. Uh, and when that happened, uh, the mayor issued uh, an evacuation order and people had to attend at various rally points, like I think baseball stadium, that kind of thing. And when they turned up, they often turned up as a family, but as a family, they brought their pets. And when they got there, they were told there were no facilities for animals. So when they were asked what they had to do, they were told to take their animals home, make them as safe as possible, then the humans had to get back there. Well, I think you don't need me to tell you what happened in so many cases. People went home with the pets and they stayed home with the pets because they weren't going to leave them. And so you know, I think this is a really, really good example of... What happens when people try and make all the best plans in the world for humans without thinking of the wider context? And I think it's also a good example of where we can use animals to say, look, and this is why animals should be part of your planning. I mean, you look at that photograph, that chap is never going to let go of that dog, is he? And so we need to, we, we need to get them to do more. And there already is, I spoke earlier about the importance of UN language. There already is language on working animals and disaster risk reduction. It's very, very brief, but we found it. Uh, and there's a whole list of what they call protective assets. So all of the, every country is supposed to have uh, a disaster reduction plan and a disaster relief plan. And in the relief plans, they should be um, protecting the assets which have been agreed. And working animals are one of those. But 
there's precious little evidence that this has been actually carried through to any great degree across the world. And of course, until more recently, there hasn't been a voice for these working animals. So you can kind of almost understand how something that was put in with very good intentions has actually not led to very much progress. But in the midterm review next year, we will, of course, be talking to governments and saying, so look, you've already agreed this wording. So what are you going to do with it? And in the current um, General Assembly, which is meeting, we're trying to get working animals into the resolution on agriculture. And this is important because when they do the SDG review next year, what's in this resolution will be key in terms of focusing their minds on what is important. So this has been, this has been my life's work this year. So I've been to three uh, lobbying trips to New York this year and endless numbers of calls and emails and uh, other interactions with UN officials and governments trying to persuade them that uh, there is a need to acknowledge that working animals are part of the uh, the midterm reviews next year. Now, I, I can't at this point tell you a result because it's ongoing, but the process is there's a draft resolution that then goes through a negotiation. What survives the negotiation goes to what they call the second committee. That's the one that votes on the language. Is this acceptable language? And then if that's acceptable language, it eventually goes to the General Assembly for approval. Uh, and this agriculture resolution is due to go to the General Assembly uh, just before Christmas. So not that far away from where we are now. But we've been working on it for a year or more now. And, and I'm pleased to say at this stage... Um, working animals are in that resolution. And so that's a big step forward in terms of linking working animals directly into the sustainable development goals and the things that governments will do as a result. It's also the negotiation has finished now. That was the most vulnerable stage because member states from around the world can pretty much play about with anything at that point. Remember what I said right at the start, this is an organisation that works on consensus. So if it's seriously upsetting somebody, then it's unlikely to survive. So we've got it through the first stage. It's going to the uh, second committee. That may happen this coming week, actually, which is quite exciting. And then if it survives that, it goes to the General Assembly. I kind of wish this symposium was just in January or something, and I could say, look what we did. Well, but anyway, it's not. <laughs> so I can only tell you where we are, uh, and uh, we shall see. But anyway, at the moment... This is what is in the resolution. So it calls for increased ambition and urgency of action to protect the lives of working animals and to strengthen global efforts to ensure that animal health can contribute to addressing environmental challenges and achieving the sustainable development goals in line with the United Nations Environmental Assembly resolution. And that's the one I was just being told about a few minutes ago. And then it goes on to say, recognises the importance of mechanisation. That bit didn't come from us, by the way, although I'm perfectly happy with it, uh, as well as the contribution of working livestock to sustainable agricultural systems. That's our bit, including economic and social resilience and therefore the delivery of the 2030 agenda. Now, you never get everything in this. It's consensual. People who are not animal welfare people get to have their say as well. I'm really happy with this. You know, if you told me when we started a few years ago, by, you know, our plan was always to try and hit the midterm review. Um, there are times when I wonder whether that was going to be possible, particularly when COVID came along and a lot of this work was difficult to get people to engage with when so many other pressing challenges were going on. Um, what I like about this uh, is, is, the, is the use of the words ambition and urgency. That's quite, they're quite big words for the United Nations. Uh, we all know that this is urgent and they need to be more ambitious in this work, but nevertheless, uh, that's good. What I don't like about it, to be honest, um, um, I did have a discussion with some of our partners there. It's, it very much talks about the, the health of working animals, which is important. Uh, I would have liked to have said health and welfare, um, but that was a challenge too far for some people at this stage. But I don't want to get, I mean, in part, it's because welfare doesn't always work great as a word across the world, but... What I would say is that if, if this gets approved, 
And then we start to talk to governments about what they are going to do as a result of it being approved. Then the definition of what is health and welfare and what they need to do, it's all on the playing field for us to for us to advocate for. So, you know, if this, you know, if this goes through, this is a really big achievement for people who are interested in working animals. And it's something that not just us, but lots of other organizations and interested people can get the teeth into and you know start to hold your own government uh, to, to account as well. Um, and that's the way we will affect change. It's where I, I don't think I said earlier that every government has to have its own plan for sustainable development goals and so it's not just a big thing that's held in new york every government has its own plan because every country is different they all have to say what they're going to do between now and the end of 2030 the things they will report on will be linked to the things that the general assembly are saying are important so in countries where there are large numbers of working animals, with a resolution like this behind us, then there's something that's very strong for us to advocate and to talk to them about what are the things that they can do to put uh, put measures in place that systemically will help their working animals um, to be protected and to live good lives uh, going on into the future. And it's a big change. What I found when, when I first went to the United Nations to talk about working animals, I never really, to be honest, I never really found that anybody was against working animals or didn't understand that they should have some sort of acceptable life. It was more that they just didn't think about them. They didn't get referred to in the same way that other animals did, you know, wildlife because it's about saving the environment in parts of the world or, or livestock because it's about feeding people or companion animals even because it's about you know people's lives. But uh, for whatever reason, the poor old working animals seem to be right down at the bottom of the list. Uh, and so a lot of our work has simply been to try and make people see that that's not right. And increasingly, I think my favourite story, you know, is I went to World Water Week um, because access to clean and accessible, uh, uh, clean and safe water, which is one of the SDGs, of course, um, in many parts of the world relies on working animals. And um, when I went to World Water Week, there were all of these organisations, some of them were people we partnered with in all sorts of ways. And there was a big expo and lots of them had massive, great displays of water being safely collected and delivered. And many, many of them had donkeys in those images, lots of them. And yet it was kind of the one word you never heard it the entire week. Well, apart from the side events I went to where it was heard at every single one. But isn't it amazing that even in a little bit of sustainable living, the access to water, where we all know donkeys are so crucial in so many parts of the world. At World Water Week, nobody was talking about them. And so all of this is starting to change that. And the one thing I can absolutely tell you, I've, I've advocated for many things in many years, that is always the starting point. The starting point is always getting people to acknowledge that the issue is there, that they've not addressed it previously, and that there are ways of addressing it in the future. So all of that gives me some hope for the future. And, and so does this. I'm just going very slightly off piste here, but only very quickly. This is coming down the line as well. So I don't know how many of you have heard of this, but there's, there's a process ongoing at the moment to get the United Nations to adopt a universal declaration on animal welfare called the UDOR. Uh, and and this is you know, this is to get the, the United Nations to finally accept that actually it's not just about people; it's about animals as well. Uh, and this is this this was a piece of work that started a few years ago, actually. Then it went into hibernation. Is probably the best best way of describing it. But but I think the way that we're, people are now starting to talk about animals and the, and, and the fact we are now starting to get some sort of recognition. I think a lot of us think this this declaration is certainly timely when well, it should have happened years ago, but uh, it's perhaps a time now where we can actually uh, make some sort of progress because of the way we've managed to persuade people to see animals as a more integral part of everything that's on the planet. And 
A few years ago, I chaired the inter um, animal welfare groups that were, that were pushing on this, and a lot of work has happened. So, so it, it will get the UN to acknowledge that animals matter and that they are sentient beings. And we'll just have that debate in the UK for anybody in the UK here. It uh, integrates animals into the UN's humanitarian and environmental work, and it helps bring pressure on governments when they are doing things where they should be doing their own animal protections. And we have a great starting base. There's already two million people have signed up to say that they think there should be uh, a UDO, so that's good. And there are already 40 governments that have agreed to, to support it. So that's a great start. It's not enough. Um, in the end, we'll have to get everybody at the UN to approve it. Um, but but I think if we could get that to about 80 or 90, then I think we would formally get it tabled and then we would seek to do that. And, and time-wise, I don't know, uh, hopefully it'll be something that'll happen over the next couple of years, but we'll see how progress will be. I should say, by the way, that this is not particularly Donkey Sanchez work, though, of course, we would be supportive of a UDO because, of course, it would help our our young work. But, but again, I thought, you know, for those in the room who have a more general animal welfare interest, just there are other things going on that perhaps will give us um, some hope for the future. And I think it's interesting to reflect why has that changed? And I don't entirely know why. I mean, I, I certainly know that there's been some brilliant advocacy from animal welfare people uh, from all over the world. I certainly know that uh, there's been increasing public awareness and pressure brought on that. All of those things are good things. There does seem to be more interest in it now. And, and ironically, you know, my mother would say, uh, and I don't know if this is just a UK term, it's an ill wind that blows no good. Um, and I think two things, which have been terrible things really, have at least had the one almost perverse outcome of uh, helping us argue the case for the importance of animals being integrated into these global discussions. Uh, and, and one of those is, of course, COVID, uh, because of the uh, the pandemic that has made a lot of people start to talk about the interactions between humans and animals in the environment and how do we get pandemics, how do they spread, and you know what are the risks of the next big zoonotic disease coming out and affecting the planet. So that's opened a door for us. And, and speaking very specifically for donkeys, and I know you'd have heard from Sean earlier today, um, the donkey skin trade. It's it, it gives me absolutely no joy to say this, I have to say, but the complete decimation of donkey numbers in some parts of the world has finally made those governments realise that donkeys are important to them. Um, you know, in Ethiopia, which currently has the world's largest donkey population, when the donkey skin trade began, there were people who thought it was not bad business. You know, um, China, it, it helped them have relationships with China, which they thought was in their country's interest. Uh, and it was a trade. They've got a lot of donkeys. It was a trade that was bringing in foreign monies into the, into the country. So uh, to begin with, I think it was seen as almost a positive. But they soon reached the stage when people were starting to say they had no donkeys for the communities or for the economic outputs. And, you know, the, Ethiopia is a country that's heavily dependent on working animals. And so now the Ethiopian government is talking not just to us, but to some of the other players we've spoken about earlier, including the FAO and, uh, and the OIE uh, and our friends in the animal welfare world, to come up with a, a national equine strategy that, can ensure that they have uh, an adequate herd of working animals for the future. Now, we don't mind being part of that discussion, provided the other side of the equation is met as well, and that they have decent lives and decent health and decent welfare, uh, and they're acknowledged as being important. So in a, in a very odd way, in a sort of strange world that we live in, it's actually taken what in some parts of the world has been an awful uh, slaughter of donkeys to make governments finally realise that they are important. And that's why we've seen, and I'm sure Sharm will have told you this, we've been able to get some slaughterhouse bans in place and export um, bans in place um, because they now realise that, 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 that these are important animals for them. The art now is to change that grown awareness. And now that their eyes are open and they're looking at it, 
how can we make sure that they do the right thing and give those animals the lives that they that they deserve and you know at the end of the day it's a very straightforward thing isn't it and that is that a sustainable world has to be sustainable not just for humans but for everything else that inhabits it so that's been a quick skip through our united nations work and you know i think that in a, the united nations traditionally moves quite slowly uh, in the years we've been doing this work considering we started with nothing to have got to the stage now where we're in we're appearing in draft resolutions and you know we're regularly being invited to the table and we've been accredited and recognized has been good progress it was always aimed at the second stage of the SDGs. That will be happening next year. And so it's how do we convert that into something that's really good for animals. Um, my email's on the screen. So please, um, if you want to send me any questions or queries, I'll just keep in touch, make a note of it. It'd be great to hear from you. And um, don't forget, I'm sure Sean mentioned it, we've got a new biosecurity report coming out tomorrow. We're hoping it's going to have some great uh, media coverage tomorrow as well. So, so keep a look out for that. Uh, and I wish you well in all your endeavours uh, with donkeys. And I'm so pleased that you're able to come to the symposium today and that you found this presentation of interest. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Ian. That was that was a very good presentation. Very lots of questions. So actually, we're going to have Dr. Noel Dibdal moderate your questions from the audience live here as well as the virtual. So here she is. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Kazi, for that um, amazing uh, presentation. I'm going to take advantage of having been handed the microphone, and I want to ask how many people in the room were familiar or aware of the 17 UN Sustainability Goals? It's great. And online, if you want to just kind of type in, I'd be curious. I'm asking because I, I'm embarrassed to say I only recently became aware of them, and I know it's been going on for a while. And so um, thank you for bringing our environmental sustainability piece together with our interests in uh, working donkeys and donkey welfare. Um, so questions in the room first. Can I ask for question? any questions in the room? Dr. Davis. Oh, he needs a mic. He needs a, yeah. yeah can you, you want to take yeah. yeah. I don't know what happened to your microphone. Sorry, they yell at you if you don't use a mic. So, uh, uh, Ian, I'm wondering if there's been any attempts to quantitate the financial value of donkey or, for that matter, any other type of traction working animal to the uh, gross domestic product of uh, of a given country uh, this sort of thing has been done for the unpaid work of women and for the value that say subsistence farmers uh, produce to be economically valuable something doesn't have to involve you know pounds or dollars or you know whatever changing hands and uh because organizations like the fao and you know, world bank and so forth see things in economic terms um have there been attempts to economically quantitate the work that these animals do yes there has but but not to the degree that would we would have liked so I, I gave that report early where I said you could download it which has some other examples it's not as good it, it, it's not as brilliant as um this is what it means for the whole GDP of that country what there are is a whole series of research projects that have shown in country x where people had a work in equity it, it led to their income being x percent above the national average that kind of thing which is all very helpful the biggest problem we have with donkeys and mules which of course is my main day job it is getting base data for those exactly those kinds of of considerations and um, the fao 
uh, does do a donkey census, which is probably the best that we've got. But we know it's full of flaws and full of holes. Um, and so one of the things, and our friends at Brook have just done a report on this, which I recommend if you've got time to download it, which is looking, at, which calls very much for um, uh, an improvement uh, and a, a greater reflection from the FAO on the donkey data that they collect, so that actually policy decisions can be born in, in more reality. At the moment, the FAO census on donkeys pretty much only records whatever the government sends in. And some governments don't even send anything in any way. And others are clearly wrong. My favourite one is that according to the FAO census, Belgium has got two donkeys. I'm not, I'm not, I, I know people in Belgium who've got more than two donkeys. Um, so it's, um, it is flawed, but we've got some very good individual case studies if we could get the figures to be more accurate, of course, then we could extrapolate and come up with national figures. But so it exists in the form, but there's more work to make it as powerful as it could be. So will you, to follow up, use those models, for example, your case example models to potentially, um, to actually model a population. So if you've got a few good case examples, uh, modelers, right, can sort of project that based on the country's ag development or degree of ag development or degree of acreage under tillage or you know some different things that could be plugged into a model that could maybe model it even though you don't have the real numbers yes exactly if if, if we could I, the the i think anyway the, the biggest the biggest problem is simply not knowing the number of donkeys that are in every part of the world um and so all modeling is going to suffer on that basis, but if we could improve that, so we very much support Brooke in there in, in the work they're doing to get those figures improved. Uh, and if we could do that, we would be able to do some really good modeling, but I wouldn't want to lose too much uh, of the value of the work that has been done. It certainly shows in different parts of the world, because these projects have been done in different climates and different economies, uh, and, the, and the results are different as well, of course, as you'd expect. But but there there are there are there is good data we can use. It's just that it can be a lot better. Questions? Hi. Yes, you've touched on a subject very dear to me, dear in quotation, which is the impact of disasters in animals in vulnerable communities, and so. I'm curious about, in terms of disaster planning and response uh, for working equids, we have given talks to some uh, communities in Central South America that have working equids in terms of trying to prepare, have a little discussion. So um, with, even here in North America, we know that we work in those communities and those that are vulnerable take a lot they have limited resources to respond and and Katri i was at katrina and they have different um at the limited resource and very protracted recovery so and not now knowing that working equids may be sort of quote unquote underestimated what are the approaches to try to address that which is on and of itself is um challenging which is the impact of disaster in vulnerable communities but now we're talking about uh, those communities that rely on working equids um i i I'm, i don't i'm not completely up to date with what uh, world animal protection are doing on this uh, at the moment because i've not worked there for a few years so now but but they did some very good work uh, the previous questioner asked about modeling they did some really really good modeling about um, the if if you prepared if you're planning uh, and your adaptations uh, in communities were there to be more disaster resilient, and that included they that remember this was World Animal Protection, so it wasn't just about working animals; it was about livestock as well. But but if communities uh, had the the planning to protect those animals through disasters, and there's all sorts of various schemes that they put in place to help with that then two things happened one was the disaster was better dealt with because they had some sort of resource particularly working animals you saw the examples that i showed there to actually deal with the event 
But perhaps even more importantly, the speed at which that society could then rebuild and come back online, if it still had livestock, if it still had work and animals, was very much quicker than those that lost them all through through a disaster. And they did some very, very good economic model in that. And, and, and I'm sure that's still pretty much in the public domain. If, if you pop me an email, I'll try and source it for you. Um, <clears throat> it's probably... Excuse me, it's probably on my old laptop if, if nowhere else. Um, but but actually what that did show is that there was a very, very clear economic benefit from having your livestock and working animals in your plans and with the measures in place to deal with them when a disaster hit. So that's what led to that initial United Nations agreeing to put working animals in the protected assets. I think what's happened since then is there really hasn't been a united voice or even any voice for working animals and so you know the one thing i've learned about animals and advocating is that you can't turn your back for a minute you know there's so and that's not a criticism there are they're being asked to do so many things that you have to keep reminding you're one of them um and so what we'll be doing uh, for, over the course of the rest of this year and certainly in 2023 We'll be talking about, you know, you've agreed to do something about this. You had all the economic modelling about why it was good. Not many of you have done it. So what can we do to make it more effective during the midterm review? But, but modelling does exist and it does certainly show that actually, um, <laughs> I always feel a bit, I'm an animal person, so I think you should do as good as the animals. I just accept you've got to have a better reason than that. And actually, economic modelling really, really helps in disaster planning. Oh, that's great. Thank you. I'd love to see you shared those resources from your laptop. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anybody it will data protection. <laughs> Please. A question here. Yeah. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, so given the overwhelming data, both for human health and for animal welfare, and given the growing um, population in the world, human population in the world, have you and the Donkey Sanctuary considered um, promoting a plant-based diet, both for yourselves and for the United Nations? And if not, why? Um, we haven't. Uh, and uh, moreover, I don't think we have any plans to. Um, we're an animal welfare organization and uh, the reality is that we know we, we uh, a very similar question we sometimes get asked by the way is so so does the donkey sanctuary think that donkeys should be worked or shouldn't be worked um you know the simple truth is is that the welfare of animals can be good or bad in all sorts of different environments so you know we have donkeys in sanctuaries and we have challenges with that Feral donkeys have challenges, farm donkeys have challenges, uh, working donkeys have challenges, uh, and they're going to exist for a very long time yet. And so we we've, we work pretty much on that, you know, and from a working animals perspective. Uh, so, so, so where donkeys are worked, they are much more worked to do jobs around the land and transport and all that kind of things. There are farm donkeys for meat and milk, and I, I heard somebody talking about them earlier. It's not many in the wider picture. So how, whatever the world does on plant-based diets, I mean, personally, I have to, I, I, let, let me tell you the donkey sanctuary line, and I'll tell you what I think personally. So the donkey sanctuary line is that um, we concentrate on those donkeys that are there now and need our help for so they live better lives and you know if the, if the world lived completely off plants there would still be millions of working donkeys so you know we, we'd still have the same challenge well i think personally by the way and i've spoken at the united nations of this but personally um is that one of the things that i find most infuriating on this planet is the fact that some people don't have enough to eat when actually there's not much evidence that that has to be the case and one of the issues around that is food waste. Uh, and there's a lot going on about food waste, but I'll tell you what food waste is. Food waste is when you take one source of food, process it through an animal and then eat the animal. Because, and I'm not getting into moral or ethical things, we, we'll all have our own views on that. The simple truth is this, when you slaughter an animal to eat it, 
for every 100 calories you would have fed that animal to get to market, you're only going to get 30 calories back through meat or dairy. And so when we're trying to feed a hungry planet, a food waste of 70%, which is what happens when you convert plant to meat, is not something that is going to help feed the world, is it? But I must stress, I'm just telling you what I think personally, the donkey sanctuary view is, is we're a welfare organisation and we stick with looking after working donkeys and mules wherever they are. Uh, and that won't change with plant-based diets, but, uh, well, you've heard my answer, so I think you know what I think. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Ian. Perhaps with that, we um, thank Ian again for a wonderful talk um, and very thought-provoking. So thank you very much. Thank you.